<laughs> we all want more time. Okay, are we good? Okay, I want to introduce you to the person that's really, not really, absolutely has made this all possible, that's uh, Walter uh, Crutenden, Crutenden, did I say that right? Yeah, uh, Walter Crutenden, and just introduce you because Many of you know he simply made this possible, but I don't know if you know anything else about him, so I want to say a few things. He said to keep it short, but I'll do my best. Um, Walter is the director of the Binary Research Institute, which is really fascinating to me. As I understand it, um, they are studying, I don't want to, I'm looking at Walter. If I'm making any mistakes, tell me. But Walter is the director of the Binary Research Institute, which is looking at the celestial mechanics related to this concept of precession that we've been hearing about all. And something that's absolutely fascinating to me is the concept that we, our sun, our solar system, may be part of a binary system. Um, and I think that's an incredible possibility. There's a lot of um, ancient mythology that would tie in with that. As I understand it, that many suns now, many stars that we're aware of are in fact parts of binary systems and may explain some of the anomalies, may explain some of the things that we've been talking about, including in my last talk. So that's very exciting. Um, Walter himself, I see as, I mean, he, he's involved in many things, historian, um, he's a historian looking at the history of ancient times, um, the theory behind it, what could be happening with these different cycles that we've been talking about all along. He has produced and written an incredible documentary called The Great Year. I'm sure as many of you have seen it and it copied available for it. For many of us, it really introduces this whole concept of the procession of the ages the cycles, the cycles of time that have become so important, I think are so important for us to be aware of. Um, he's also written an excellent book called Lost Star of Myth and Time, and I recommend it to everyone. Um, so please pick up a copy of that. It's, it's just an you know, incredible work that's being done here. And I could go on, but I want to just mention, that last but not least, he is the founder of the CPAC series, Conference on Procession and Ancient Knowledge. It's now in its fifth, is that correct? This is the fifth annual CPAC. Um, I've had the pleasure of being at, um, I think all of them except the very first one. I believe the first one was actually not open to the public. Is that correct, Walter? Yeah. Um, but it's been going on and I think it's important not just for bringing much of this knowledge to the public, you know, audiences for people to come and interact, but also for people like myself who have been presenting. It's really, it really has affected me, and I think in a very positive way, to get me interacting with other people, to be thinking about these types of issues. I know that every time I leave CPAC, I go on all these questions in my mind, and it causes me to start looking into things seriously and researching things that, you know, three years ago I didn't think I'd be looking at. Um, so it's had very much a personal effect on me and I want to thank Walter for that very much and how he's made this really all possible for all of us. So I present to you and I believe he'll be talking about Hamlet's Mill today, which is absolutely central to the themes um, that all of us are studying here at the Conference on Procession and Ancient Knowledge. Th so thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. Is this working? So good morning again. This is a book that really turned me on when I first read it. And so it's a, a privilege and an honor to be with you and talking about what I think is one of the most interesting books, if not one of the most revealing books in academia today, and that is Hamlet's Mill. And as a matter of fact, I dedicated my own book to, uh, to two other people. One was Sri Yukteswar, and one was the uh, authors of this book, Giorgio de Santillana and Hertha von Deschen. So I know that uh, some of the other speakers mentioned it briefly, and we will, uh, I'll, I'll kind of uh, try to cover mostly new information in this. Interesting that uh, myth and folklore has been around for 
thousands of years to the very beginning of history. And, uh, and yet we're just getting around to exploring it. We're just getting around to uh, looking at it in a scientific way, is just considering it as gibberish of ancient people. And so today I'd like to cover four points, but let me start with a little intro on the authors. Giorgio de Santiana was the former professor of the history of science at MIT. He was the chair of that department. He had his degree in physics, uh, studied astronomy, uh, mathematics, uh, was really a very uh, good scholar and also known as a bit of a mystic. And the younger Hertha von Deschen, older in this picture obviously, but uh, she had studied under the great Frobenius, and she was a uh, uh, cultural ethnologist and held a similar post to Giorgio over at Goethe University on the Frankfurt University campus. And she had the suspicion that uh, history wasn't quite as we were being taught in the textbooks. And the reason for this is she had studied many different cultures around the world, including the Dogon that Laird talked about yesterday, cultures. And she found that their histories were so much different than our own. And so she became suspicious. And Giorgio had shared these same concerns. In fact, he had written a book in the early 60s called Origins of Science, where he traced the origins of science not just to the Renaissance or not just to the Greeks, but way back to prehistory, uh, to the very fringes of, of uh, any recorded history. So you might call these two the uh, Robert Schock and the John Anthony West of their era. They were the first two alternative historians. And so uh, today we'll cover four points. The first is that myth and folklore is not just gibberish, it is a scientific language. And Giorgio believed that there were great minds in pre on par with a, a Newton or a Kepler or an Einstein, but that they spoke a completely different language. They spoke something that we can hardly even relate to, uh, not to mention understand. The second point I want to cover is that procession is a recurring theme. Now, they don't always call it procession, but they talk about a movement of the stars, and they often refer to it as a mill, or a quern, or a sampo, or a dial, or something that turns. And as it turns, it affects time, it actually creates time. The ancients believed that it ushered in new eras, new epochs in history that were completely different than the prior epoch. And personally, I believe that when we really understand this mill and how it works, we help place back in history. We find out where we are in time. And that's something that's very precious that I think has been lost by this linear view that anything that came before us must be more primitive. Uh, with that view, uh, there's really nothing to learn in ancient history. And yet, as we're hearing uh, throughout this conference, there's a lot we can learn from the ancients. And it all makes sense in context of this mill. And the final point I want to cover is that there's a little bit of Hamlet in each of us. <laughs> and Hamlet is uh, just the, the name character uh, that Shakespeare, of course, used for his hero in, in his story. Uh, but it's a character that we find throughout history, and we'll talk about that in some detail. So let's get going here. Uh, the setup here, I want to read a little bit from both uh, Hertha's voice and Giorgio's voice so you can kind of hear where they're coming from. But the setup on this one is that Hertha had been working on understanding myth and folklore for many years, and she hadn't been making much progress. And she'd thought about astronomy, but she uh, didn't like astronomy. She was a little scared of it. And so uh, she was uncomfortable with it. And 
stayed away from it. Nonetheless, she found herself in the Polynesian Islands where she'd been studying their myths and folklores for over a year and nothing made sense to her, so she's getting mad. And uh, here's what she has to say here. Let me get some modern technology to help me out here a little bit. <laughs> My growing wrath about the current interpretations based upon discouraging translations was a helpful spur now and then. In fact, there was nothing that could be called a start, least of all the intention to explore the astronomical nature of myth. To the contrary, on my having come from ethnology to the history of science, there existed in the beginning only the firm decision never to become involved in astronomical matters under any condition. <laughs> in order to keep safely away from this frightening field, my subject of inquiry was meant to be the mythical figure, Asman God, the demiurge in his many aspects, Hephaestus, Vashtri, Whalen, the smith, Ilmarinen, Ta, Enki Ia, Tain, Viracocha, and she mentions about a half a dozen others. And for those of you that aren't familiar with this concept, uh, I like uh, sort of the Vedic concept the best. It's easiest to understand in that God is absolute beyond all creation. He wants to play, wants to go out and have fun. So he creates a copy of himself. And this copy is not only creation, uh, only it's, uh, it's himself in creation, Hudasta. And so uh, that's a concept to keep in mind as we go along here. And it's something that's uh, embedded in myth and folklore around the world. Not even a whiff of suspicion came to me during the investigation of Mesopotamia. Of all cultures, everything looked so very terrestrial, though slightly peculiar. It was after having spent more than a year, over 10,000 pages of Polynesian myths collected in the 19th century, that the annihilating recognition of our ignorance came down upon me like a sledgehammer. There was no single sentence that could be understood. And I think most of us would just quit and go get another job at that point, you know. <laughs> but she stuck with it. But then if anybody had to be taken seriously, it had to be the Polynesians guiding their ships securely over the largest ocean of our globe, navigators to whom our much praised discoverers from Magellan to Captain Cook confided the steering of their ships more than once. Thus the fault had to rest with us, not with Polynesian myth. Still I did not buy astronomy. There was a strict determination on my part to avoid it. I looked into the archaeological remains of the many islands, and there a clue was given me. To, be call it, to call it being struck by lightning would be more correct, which I duly followed up on, and then there was no salvation anymore. Astronomy could not be escaped. And let me just uh, clarify what that myth is or that site is that she was talking about. First, one sentence from Giorgio he, here. He says, the moment of grace came when on looking on a map at two little islands, mere fly specks on the Pacific, that a strange accumulation of maras or cult places could be explained only one way. They and only they were both exactly sighted on two neat celestial coordinates, the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn. And so here she's uh, in the Polynesian island, checking out all this myth and folklore. And she noticed these uh, two famous uh, cult places, which archaeologists now recognize as astronomical observations, ancient, ancient observatories. And they're exactly on this, uh, the tropics here, the Tropic of Cancer and Capricorn, which is the extent of the Earth's tilt related to the ecliptic, related to the plane as it goes around the sun. And that's 23 and a half degrees, and it's where the solstice will be directly overhead uh, in either hemisphere there. And she was most interested in, uh, in this one right here. It's, it's right on this Tropic of Cancer. It's a little island called 
Necker Island, that's what the French named it, I think in Hawaiian it's Makum. And it's not big, it's only about 1,200 yards long and about 100 yards wide. And it, uh, it doesn't have any permanent source of water on it. It really doesn't have much vegetation unless it's rained uh, recently. Hard to get up on. Uh, there's no good uh, ports. This one little cove here happens to be on the, the windward side, which they call Shark Bay now. And the nearest the habitat was uh, over 200 miles away. And yet the Polynesians again and again uh, and built this uh, ancient observatory that we find many similar ones around the world today. And they left a lot of statutes there. Many of them now have been taken to museums, but it shows archaeologists that they spent a fair amount of time on this habitable island that was so far from their homeland, and they did it for some reason. And that, that reason uh, it dawned on Hertha was astronomy and she started to put all this together. And so Bill talked a little bit about uh, something she found here, but it was, it was a logos that they developed, that uh, planets were gods. So uh, Jupiter is Zeus, and Saturn is Kronos, and Venus is Venus, etc. But every language has these names. And animals, of course, were continents. Taurus the bull, Ares the ram, Leo the lion, and uh, hundreds of others. And then uh, all these things lie upon uh, some topographic reference. And so when they're talking about a mountain, they're talking about the top of the sky, talking about um, a river, they're talking about the Milky Way. And when they're talking about the underworld, they're literally talking about stars that are under the world from where they are. They're on the other side of the uh, horizon. And so uh, Jupiter is uh, meeting Mars uh, at the Milky Way. It's a way of telling time. We know that when Jupiter conjuncts Mars at that particular spot, there's only a few points when that happens and tell when, they're, uh, when this myth is referring to. And most interestingly, all these things lie upon this disk or dial or frame or mill or, or quern that turns with time. So Giorgio and Hertha discover this language that has large to do with astronomy. And Giorgio would say that it's really the beginning of modern science, because by watching the stars, they become aware of uh, rhythm, uh, timing, they count, and that's why he traces science to myth. And so I'd like to uh, just give you uh, a little bit of Giorgio's voice, and then we'll go on here. Uh, the setup here is Giorgio talking about Amlodi. And Amlodi is the original hamlet in the Icelandic tradition. The, these myths are so similar, it's, it's amazing. And, and Amlodi's mill that he owns, it's, which is the procession of the equinox, and how its description morphs into all these characters throughout these various. And um, let's see where it's at. The intensity and richness the coincidence of details in this cumulative thought have led to the conclusion that it all had its origin in the Near East. It is evidence that this indicates a diffusion of ideas to an extent hardly by current anthropology. But this science, although it has dug up a marvelous wealth of details, has been led by its modern evolutionary and psychological bent to forget about the main source of myth, which was astronomy, the royal science. This obliviousness is itself a recent event, barely a century old. Today, expert philologists tell us that Saturn and Jupiter are names of vague deities, subterranean or atmospheric, superimposed on the planets at a late period. They neatly sort out folk origins and late derivations, 
all unaware that Terry periods, sidereal and synodic, were known and rehearsed in numerous ways by celebrations already traditional in archaic times. Ancient historians would have been aghast had they been told that obvious things were to become unnoticeable. Aristotle was proud to state it as no gods were originally stars, even if popular fantasy had later obscured this truth. He could not guess that W.D. Ross, his modern editor, would condescendingly annotate, this is historically untrue. Yet we know that Saturday and Sabbath had to do with Saturn, Wednesday and Mercredi had to do with Mercury. Such names are as old as time, as certainly as the planetary heptagram of the Heranians. They go back far before Professor Ross's Greek philology. The inquiries of great and meticulous scholars, Eidler, Lepson, Wolson, Bull, etc., taught several relevant lessons to the historians of culture. But interest shifted to other goals, as can be seen from current anthropology, which has built up its own idea of the primitive and what came after. So presently, uh, historians date the, the zodiac only back as far as the Greeks, about 600 BC or so. And when Hertha and Giorgio were writing this book, which was published in 1969, uh, the oldest culture at the time was the Heranians, which is about 6,000 years. When I was growing up, the textbooks had it at about 5,000 years. So it's, uh, it's amazing then that they've, we've been able to effectively double the period of civilization by some mind. So this is one at Gobekli Tepe, which uh, one or two other speakers have touched on. And uh, the, the iconography that we find on these pillars all over this site has to do with these animals that are key in many myths around the world. Or in the aurochs, uh, over here there's one, uh, a bull that's on the ecliptic, a uh, lion, a uh, scorpion down there. This is reminiscent of some of the Egyptian iconography where there's often a, a bird or wings that are carrying the sun. And this goes back to uh, 12,000 BC, 11 to 12,000 BC. The site wouldn't even exist had it not been buried for some reason. It was buried in ancient times. And so these stones are really in good shape. It's just now being investigated. Uh, but they appear to be set up in various directions. Uh, there's no roof or ceiling on these, almost as if they're viewing points. And if you sort of step back and look at it, this site is a couple football fields uh, in size. And apparently, these primitives were uh, unaware that they're only supposed to build square objects. <laughs> but it's, it almost looks like modern art. And you know, if one has this view that the ancients are primitive, then I suppose you, they, you'd kind of say, well, this is a cult place, and they go there to slaughter animals, and that's what these pictures are for. But I like to think that, you know, here we are 12,000 years ago, and we're bringing our, uh, ourselves or our family there, maybe on our birthday, to see what the stars look like exactly at that time. Or perhaps we're there on an equinox or solstice for a celebration, and these were very common dates of celebration uh, in the past. And you could just walk around to these uh, various stations and sites with a cup of tea and, and enjoy it. But if you kind of think about what some of the other speakers were talking about, the, the different stages in the yugas, if, if you're really that advanced this, this long ago, then maybe you're not just talking about it. You're, you're really telepathically uh, feeling it from the stars coming in. So. We have no idea what these sites were for, but it's, uh, it's fun that we're finally dis rediscovering some of them and trying to put the pieces together.
Giorgio gives us uh, another sentence here. One still reads in that most unscientific of records, the Bible, that God disposed of all things by number, weight, and measure. Ancient Chinese texts say that the calendar and the pitch pipes have such a close fit, did not fit a hair between them. People read it and think nothing of it, yet such hints might reveal a world of vast and firmly established complexity, infinitely different from ours. But the experts now are benighted by the current folk fantasy, which is the belief that they are beyond all this, critics without sense and extremely wise. We're moving along here. It's, it's really blasphemy in the Church of Science today to suggest that anybody knew of precession prior to Hipparchus in 127. And yet Giorgio says there's good reason to believe that Hipparchus didn't discover precession, that he actually rediscovered it, because there are so many uh, hints out there. And yet this statement really got a lot of uh, people mad, and, and so Hamlet first came out was uh, critically uh, uh, reviewed. And the astronomers were mad because uh, they said that, you know, precession is this very subtle motion, and certainly some primitives couldn't have uh, been able to detect it. The anthropologists were bothered be sort of the same reason that um, ancient people shouldn't know such a thing. And historians, of course, were mad because they have to rewrite history. Uh, and here's one reviewer here. He said, this courageous enterprise has produced a difficult, disorderly, and provocative book based on the, that the great international myths represent an explanation of the structure of the universe, and that this explanation, long since forgotten, except in its picturesque narrative form, was actually mathematical and derived from astronomical observation. If this scandalously oversimplified description boggles the nation, let the reader not take alarm. The book is equally boggling, but much more persuasive. It is likely to draw howls of protest from the scholars whose fields have been raided. And indeed it did, and it is still to this very day, although it sells more copies now today than it did back then, uh, people are just still fighting about these ideas, which probably means there's some truth there. This is uh, one of the statutes you find in, uh, I think it's Norway or one of the Nordic countries. And it's uh, honoring this, this old myth that they have up there, uh, two maids that never sleep but turn the sampo as it grinds out different ages. And if you read this whole uh, story, these maids are uh, celestial uh, gods, and that's why they never sleep. And they... Uh, they change the world ages through this process. And the bigger point here that is that the ancients had a, uh, a mechanism for telling time that uh, we want to look at a little more carefully. Now, Copernicus said the Earth has three motions. The first motion is, of course, its axis, and it gives us night and day, and it not only does that, it actually changes our consciousness. Four or five hours ago, we were all in a subconscious state, and 10 or 12 hours from now, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll be back in that state. Hopefully, we're all in a waking state right now. Uh, and it's because our bodies have adapted to the motion of the Earth, but it actually affects our consciousness. And the second motion, of course, is just as profound, Trillions and trillions of life forms will just uh, pop out of the ground, uh, give their bloom, fruit, and then decay. And the opposite thing is going on on the other side of the world during the same time. And as that's happening, uh, billions of animals are migrating, spawning, hibernating. So these motions of the Earth have a dramatic, dramatic effect on not just consciousness, but all life. So if there is a third motion, then one could expect that it would have an equally profound effect uh, over time. And the problem is that this third motion is thought to be just a, some obscure wobbling in the Earth that has nothing to do with anything. And, uh, and I think we've lost something there. And here's what Giorgio says. He says, 
Procession has lost relevance for our affairs, whereas once it was the only majestic and secular motion that our ancestors could keep in mind when they looked for a great cycle which could have humanity as a whole. But then our ancestors were astronomers and astrologers. They believed that the sliding of the sun along the equinoctial point affected the frame of the cosmos and determined a succession of world ages under which different zodiacal signs would occur. They had found a large peg on which to have thoughts about cosmic time, which brought all things in fateful order. Today, that order has lapsed, like the idea of the cosmos itself. There is only history which has been fallaciously described as one damn thing after another. <laughs> but the ancients watched the sky and and procession was not some obscure motion. They would know it better than we would. You know, they, could, they watched the moon, obviously, and got all those patterns down. We know that very well. They watched the stars, stories about the different constellations. And then they noticed that the planets and the sun moves through key constellations, and that you can not only uh, tell yearly time with that, that you could tell great yearly time with that. That over a very long period of time, the stars would seem to move backwards. Instead of processing, they would precess a relative to their normal pattern and go through each of the uh, different signs there. And that the ancients had the tools should not be doubted. This is uh, Newgrange. This is a site in Ireland. It's 6,000 years old. It's, uh, it's a mammoth structure. It's kind of shaped a little bit like a womb here. Just has this one passage in it. These interesting uh, diagrams on the outside, they, they occur there, and they occur at the very back end of the, the chamber. And only once during the year on the windows does the sun enter this light box above the door and comes right down this chamber and lights up this uh, little mural on the back. And so all you need to do to figure out precession is, is understand there's fixed stars and then understand that there's a few hour hands, and they can be the solstice or the equinox. And I don't think they could have built a structure like this and not know about procession. The bigger question is, you know, why were they so fascinated with this? Why were they so did? And yet, we aren't. And that takes us to the workings of the mill here. It, it, they weren't just watching this motion and, and marking it. They were embedding in all their uh, mythology, or much of their mythology, and it, it was rich and had a beautiful uh, historical context for them. Uh, they tied the, the rising and falling ages to it. And so here's a snippet from another myth here. Again, one from one of the Nordic countries, a fabled mill which in his own time ground out gold and peace and plenty. Later, in decaying times, it ground out salt, which was still valuable uh, somewhat in ancient times. And now, finally, having landed at the bottom of the sea, it is grinding rock and sand, creating a vast pool, the maelstrom. So obviously, this, this poem there is being uh, recited in, in lower times. And I wanted to just uh, read one more thing from Giorgio so you can understand uh, how he I decided to call this thing hell. The figure of Hamlet as a favorable starting point came by chance. Many other avenues offered themselves, rich in symbols and beckoning with great images, but the choice went to Hamlet because he led the mind on a truly inductive quest through a familiar landscape, and one which has the merit of its literary setting. Here is a character 
deeply present to our awareness, in whom ambiguities and uncertainty, tormented self-questioning and dispassionate insight give a presentment of the modern mind. His personal drama was that he had to be a hero, but still try to avoid the role destiny assigned him. His lucid intellect remained above the conflict of motives. In other words, his was and is a truly contemporary consciousness. And yet this character, whom the poet made one of us, the first unhappy intellectual, concealed the past as a legendary being, his features predetermined, pre-shaped by long-standing myth, a numinous aura around him, and many clues led up to him. But it was a surprise to find behind the mask an ancient and all-embracing cosmic power, the original master of the dreamed-of first stage of the world, the Demiurge. He, too, is a son to avenge his father, a speaker of cryptic but inescapable truths. To be or not to be, that is the question. An elusive carrier of fate who must yield once his mission is accomplished and sink once more into concealment in the depths of time to which he belongs. Lord of the Golden Age, the one future king. This is a really great book. Uh, get it if you have the chance. And uh, by the Dark Ages, this, uh, this play that had been told in the skies, of course, we'd gone to a material level by that standpoint. Uh, they'd moved this, uh, this quern, this whirling thing from the sky down into a whirlpool in the ocean. And uh, medieval uh, sailors would watch out for this thing, and it was placed on a lot of maps. So we talked a little bit about this yesterday. And of course, here's the 12 signs of the zodiac. If this was a, sort of a planisphere of the, of the uh, sky, then the Milky Way kind of runs along this over here, like this. And you can tell time with it. And as David Steinmetz talked about, we're, we're presently uh, down here somewhere, according to uh, Euctus War. And there's tons of myths about this. We don't have too many myths from this last ascending because it was so long ago. You know, 20, 24,000 years is, is a whole cycle. Uh, there are a lot of myths about the last golden age, you know, the beautiful tales by Hesiod, this, this time of peace and plenty, this time when uh, the land was rich with fruit. Uh, you didn't have to toil too much and you lived to be a ripe old age, and when you died, it was just like going to sleep. And then, of course, there's many myths about the uh, de descending age also, and uh, those are a little bit darker. This is uh, Terra Mater, or Lori Pratt's uh, depiction of the cycles. It's got a little bit more detail. For those of you that are interested, you can find her, uh, her uh, document, uh, Astrological World Ages Online. And so the ancients used this marker of the heavens to figure out where they are. And most people nowadays uh, use the vernal equinox, the spring equinox, uh, which was sort of a dark age invention to talk about the ages. Uh, but if that's true, we're, we're in a golden age right now and uh, on our way down. But uh, Euctus War and uh, some of the other ancient cultures seem to prefer the autumnal equinox, uh, which shows that we're, we're just barely out of the dark ages, just sort of had the, re the renaissance of the ascending cycle. And... Uh, I think the autumnal equinox is correct. From an astrological standpoint, I understand that we're affected by both ends due to polarity, although that's not my area of expertise. We find this, this mythology about this great year embedded uh, throughout many, many cultures. Uh, this is from Daniel uh, in the Old Testament. And Nebuchadnezzar has a dream where there's a king that has a head of gold, a chest of silver, a torso of bronze, and legs of iron. 
And so they go get Daniel the prophet to figure out what this means. And, and Daniel tells him, well, king, uh, since this, in the dream, the, this uh, statue was collapsing uh, or going towards the bronze and iron, it, it shows that your uh, kingdom is going to fall. Babylonia fell, as did every ancient culture prior to the Dark Ages. But he said, don't worry about it, it'll, it'll rise again. So you can find that in the book of Daniel, the, the other pages, and it's very interesting. Other cultures that's talked about this were the, uh, the Mithraic culture uh, is one I like. They found these uh, temples underground all over uh, ancient Rome and much of Europe. And these uh, temples here all have this pteroctony inside them. The pteroctony is, is our hero character, in this case Mithras, and he's slain Taurus, which is the last sign before the golden age of, of Ares. And uh, he's surrounded by two boys. One is Cautes, who is holding the torch up, which is an indication of that's the ascent, more light is coming into the world. And the other is Cautopetes, who's holding the torch down. And of course, that's the indication that the light is going out, the, out of the world. The uh, Christian era helped preserve a lot of these temples uh, because they were built right below ground and they just filled them with trash. And, and now we have uh, more on this than some of the early Christian era. The main god in this mystery school is Mithras, and he is called uh, by David Ulances and some of the other scholars here the hypercosmic sun. It seems to be a sun beyond the sun that is responsible for turning this wheel of procession. So the, the present idea on, uh, on how procession works is that uh, the Earth is a little fat at the middle and it's tugged by the gravity of the, the moon and the sun, and that's what wobbles it around a little bit. The ancients seem to have a little different idea, and they said that the whole solar system is moving through space. And as it does so, it uh, gives us this view of the, uh, the different constellations. And I tend to like this, uh, this reason. One is because I can't find any evidence whatsoever that the Earth actually wobbles relative to anything within the solar system, but it clearly moves relative to things outside the solar system. So it's an indication that the whole solar system is moving. But two, because it gives you a cause or a, a reason why you might have these uh, changing ages. If we are really taking this vast journey through space that over long periods of time, this view of the different constellations where the sun appears to rise in these different marks, then I think you have a, a method for changing consciousness over long periods of time. And John Daring spoke on this at some previous conferences, so I'm not going to get into a lot of detail. But uh, there's a whole science about how uh, our ionosphere, our magnetosphere, and even consciousness itself might be affected by uh, different distances in relation to stellar sources, which are huge generators of electromagnetic energy. But getting back to the mythology side, uh, you know, that we find this uh, statement in the Bible here. Sri Yuktis War says our, our sun goes around another star, and, but it's not the other star so much that's having the effect. It's that it's moving our system closer to another point in space. When we get closer to there, it has this beneficial effect, this sweet influence. And we do find one mention of that in the Bible, of course, in the book of Job. And, and look at this as a rhetorical question. Canst thou bind the sweet influence of the Pleiades? or loose the bands of Orion? Can we really stop the, the seasons in summer as much as we'd all like to live there? We can't do that any more than we can stop the great year in the, in the golden age. These are natural processes that just have to go on, and you can't stop them any more than you can break the stars in Orion apart. And I think that's what that means. 
There's a well-known anthropologist, Jared Diamond, and he teaches us uh, in his book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, that we are affected by our environment and our geography, that wherever uh, uh, the guys went that had the, the guns and the bad germs and the steel, they would usually do better than the guys that didn't, at least from a material standpoint. And I think this ancient idea is just lifting that whole concept up one level, saying it's not just the geography and environment of mankind on Earth that makes a difference. It's also the geography and the environment of the Earth in space that has this macro effect over very, very long periods of time. So the mill there then, when we understand about it, we really start to uh, see our place in history a little bit. One of the neat things about uh, a lot of this mythology is that, uh, you know, these are stories that have lasted for thousands of years. You can, till the 19th, the early parts of the 20th century, they could find uh, two families on opposite sides of Finland. They're illiterate. They bring them together to recite the, the Edda, and they would both exactly say the same thing, word for word, verse, because these things have been memorized uh, so perfectly over the years. Same thing uh, with the Vedas. And that's how important these things were. So when Jesus is saying something like, as ye sow, so shall ye reap, he's not just talking about farming, although that would help this uh, the statement carry on, he's talking about a deeper truth, which I think, you know, many of us understand now that that refers to reincarnation and, and karma and that sort of thing. Well, likewise, these myths that we, we find uh, written down through history that just don't seem to go away, that have this archetypal influence on us, are talking about deeper truth. And so, Hercules, uh, in his 12 labors here is, is sort of uh, this process that the hero goes through to, to purify himself to get to a higher state. And the, the 12 labors might be, a, you know, sort of a microcosm of the great year, I'm not sure. Uh, but this one right here is when he takes on the Nemean lion. This is some invulnerable lion that he just cannot... Uh, kill with the sword or any other way until he subdues its breath. And there's a very deep uh, yogic meaning inside this myth. Those that can control their breath through pranayama can get to some of these higher states. Or uh, Jason over here, he, he and the Argonauts are looking for the golden fleece. You've all heard that one, I'm sure. Well, what is the golden fleece? At the fleece is the coat of Aries. Aries is, the, is where the sun is in the golden age. And so when Jason is looking for the golden fleece, he's looking for this golden age consciousness. That is the journey he's, he's on. And these things happen uh, both outwardly and inwardly. So let me try to figure out, uh, pull the pieces together here. At the very beginning of the book, Giorgio mentions a, a myth uh, called invariance. I think it's the second or third line of the book, and it's just one sentence here. He says, the Greeks, as earth, early as the seventh century BC, spoke of the quest of their first sages as the problem of the one and the many. Times describing the wild fecundity of nature as the way in which the many could be deduced from the one, sometimes seeing the many as unsubstantial variations being played on the one. And if you think about it, you know, we've been hearing a lot about cosmology. The story really hasn't changed much, even the modern cosmology here. Scientists today, physicists, mathematicians are looking for the beginning of time. What was it like in the first few seconds after the Big Bang? And they use physics and math to, to find this out. Or this Hadron Collider that uh, talked about that they're starting up in CERN. What are they doing? They're trying to find out where the one split into the many, where the many came from. 
or tracing myth and folklore back to its source. And it's not just that we're trying to find out where it came from. It's that we're trying to find out where we came from. That's the story that's being commemorated and told over and over again in so many of these myths, whether it's ancient myths or modern myths. And Joseph Campbell called this the hero journey, this uh, character throughout history, whether you call him Hamlet or Amlodi or, or Froda, which, by the way, is a name right out of uh, some of the Nordic myths. And the, the character is, which is commemorated ours, is uh, doing different things, but, but kind of always rediscovering himself. So in this case, uh, you know, it's the biggest selling movie of all time, $3 billion, something like that. It's just a guy trying to get rid of a ring. <laughs> but he found himself along the way. Or Star Wars, you know, another huge seller. Why do we like these things so much? They're telling us about ourselves. And in this case, uh, Luke, uh, you know, wants to speed up his progression, and he gets himself a guru here, Yoda. Or sometimes it's, we're just doing regular things. It's, it's you and me. We're going to work, we're going to school, and we're realizing that there's something more to us, that, that we are the demiurge. We are this aspect of God that's in creation. Beautiful journey, this magnificent adventure, just trying to find ourselves. And sometimes we do. So then, <laughs> Hamlet is this character then. He's got a thousand faces, as Joseph Campbell said. He's thrown into these ever-changing circumstances. They, they simply try him to the core again and again. But the result is that this person rediscovers themselves. They rediscover their powers, their ability, and where they came from, and remember that they're the son of a king. And so that's really what uh, Hamlet's Mill is about. It's this character who's battling these forces. Uh, it's usually depicted outwardly as villains and animals and uh, commemorated in the heavens or reenacted there and because the story was so important, you know, as planets conjuncting constellations, etc. But it's really a timeless story of self-discovery and, and it's a grand and beautiful story. One of the neat things, though, that, that I like this, uh, this story is that besides going through it outwardly, the, uh, some of the ancient cultures teach us that there's a little zodiac inside us, that the chakras, bipolarity, these six chakras here, uh, represent the zodiac. And they teach that there are certain techniques, certain things that the, the yogi or the the adept, the shaman, the initiate can do to uh, lift their consciousness. So we can either just kick back and enjoy as we go through the great year, reincarnating many, many times over and over, many great years probably, or we can uh, sort of speed up the process uh, through the inward evolution. And that's the deeper teaching here, I think. And I hope you'll uh, keep that in mind as as you think about these, uh, these. And so just to refresh your point on these four points, myth and folklore is not gibberish. It is a deep and beautiful language of an ancient people. Uh, procession is a recurring theme here. It's, it's a mill that, that changes the adventure for us. And when we really understand this mill, we find ourselves our place in time, and that there's a little bit of Hamlet in each of us. You know, we can play the dim-witted fool, or we can play the hero. It's totally up to us. So let me leave you with a modern rendition of, of this Hamlet character here, and I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> 